Yes, you're back. Thank you for tuning in again. Yes, this is the real story. You have the correct channel. You picked the right time. I'm Daniel Hapney, kind of a host. Do I have the hostess with the mostest? No. But today I have a very good show. When I say a good show, I'm calling it 9-11 Part 2. When I say Part 2, Part Dukes, The Awakening. It's been years since 9-11. We now have a time clock, timepiece in the center of town, which I thought was interesting. And now maybe we can start looking and uh, scientifically considering, were we lied to? And who would even think we were lied to? So I brought you people who say we were lied to. Huh. Let's find out. Maybe you can think for yourself. I know you can. You've been with me now for a couple of shows. Yes, it's a good feeling, isn't it? <sighs> Thinking for oneself. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful thing. All right, got my good shirt for you. Remember the question? Yeah. Hmm. What do you know about Building 7? So here we go. We're going to start off with a little something. I thought this was interesting. Now that, through a Freedom of Information request, NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, held more than, they're still holding all sorts of data away from the American people. But they've released about five terabytes of video they wouldn't show you. They collected it all, like the 80 cameras around the Pentagon. You got to see what? Five frames. That's right, five frames. Two frames in a field, or excuse me, you got to see five fields, two fields in a frame, if I got that right, you got about a sixth of a second anyway of video to see what hit the Pentagon. But that's not important for this show. What's important for this show is for you to consider, to ask questions. Here's where we'll start. Here's one of the questions I have. I was going over some video, and um, I saw there's this foreign guy in fatigues. It's 9-11. He's got the dust on him, you know, from 9-11. Uh, from and he doesn't speak English. I want you to remember these words. Um, nothing information. Play him. The building's going to collapse. Nothing information. And it's always dangerous. The building's going to collapse. Nothing information. The building's going to collapse. Nothing information. The building's going to collapse. Nothing information. Is not, is nothing information. Now, maybe he just happened to be on the street. I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Why? Uh, it throws a little in. Like, what's he doing on the streets of New York fully fatigued? Rather interesting. I don't know why. But let's go with this. Um, on 9-11, as you remember, you know, planes smashed into two buildings. Yet three buildings collapsed totally in their footprints, falling at free fall speed. That defies physics, by the way. And we're told, hey, physics doesn't work on 9-11. But I want you to... Um, I want you to listen to a chemical engineer. Here's a graduate of Worcester Polytech. You know that, you Massachusetts viewers, because here we're in the place of Worcester Polytech. And uh, he's been a chemical engineer for 25 years. He has a degree in chemical engineering. And he happened to, after someone published a study saying we're finding nanothermite, an explosive, a cutting charge used only by the military in the dust at the World Trade Center. Well, don't believe me. I'm only Dan Hapney, but maybe you want to listen to a licensed chemical engineer. Here you go. My name is Mark Basile. I'm a chemical engineer. I have a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I've worked for about 25 years in industry, and the majority of what I do is analytical work uh, and figuring out what materials are composed of, why they are what they are, why they do what they do. It's uh, basically a lot of material science is what I do. I started looking into 9-11 from the beginning. I had some serious questions based on some of my readings. Uh, an example there would be the R.J. Lee report and then the uh, FEMA report, Appendix C specifically, that got into some metallurgical analysis of some steel beams that were found from the World Trade Center um, location, which were actually analyzed by professors at the school that I went to, WPI. Uh, when I looked into both the R.J. Lee report and the FEMA report, Appendix C specifically, I just had a lot of questions, so I really started doing a lot more digging into uh, things. And ultimately, in December of 2007, I attended a conference in Boston on 9-11 where Stephen Jones was going to be speaking about his work on the iron-based microspheres. I attended the conference and listened to him talk where he also, uh, for the first time, discussed his discovery of the red-gray chips that 
we'll get into a little bit later here. Uh, after he spoke, I approached him and I was interested in being in, put in contact with a source for World Trade Center dust to independently uh, look at the material and either confirm or deconfirm uh, what he had found. Uh, about a month later, I received my first sample of World Trade Center dust from Jeanette McKinley, which was one of the individuals that, you know, was spoken of in his uh, report on the thermetic materials that he put out in March of 2009, I think it was. Um, so anyway, I received a sample of dust in January of 2008 and basically started working with the material. Um, I found iron-based microspheres in there, just as he had done. Uh, and I also found the red-gray uh, chips that he had spoken of. I then began to do some analytical work on them, and I found that their composition was basically exactly what he had described. I was hoping to conduct some experiments uh, with these chips, but I have not been able to get access to a differential scanning calorimeter. So I basically sat and thought for a while about what experiments I could run on these chips to try and, you know, elucidate some of their properties of being thermitic. I created an apparatus where I could basically control uh, energy input to the chips, heating them resistively on a stainless steel heater strip uh, to an ignition temperature, not overheating them, but just bringing them up to the ignition temperature and then analyzing the uh, resultant products. And what I can confirm also is that these chips, the red layer is thermitic, it does produce molten iron, and I've seen it in a number of chips that Janet or Jeanette McKinley supplied to me, and I've also seen it in an independent sample that was also supplied to me from a museum in New York, which is asked to remain anonymous at this point in time. But I've independently seen uh, thermitic activity within two separate independent samples of World Trade Center dust, and I plan to look at more in the next month or so and uh, keep on going. And I guess the other thing that I'd like to say is anybody out there who has these types of capabilities, uh, there's no reason why I should be looking at these things alone. The more people who can confirm, just like I've done, confirming the work of others, uh, the more confidence we all have in the legitimacy of those results. And uh, I'd really like to stress that we need a lot more people involved in this work than just the few of us that are doing it right now that I know of. One of the things I'd like to stress about these chips is that they uh, really shouldn't be there. They're not uh, a natural formed um, agglomeration of aluminum from the aircraft or materials that were in the building and iron oxide that got knocked off. It isn't just a haphazard bringing together of iron oxide and aluminum, which is the basic components of thermite. This is a material that um, is made up of nano-sized particles that are all very uniform, very symmetrical. Uh, it's in a silica-based matrix that holds the th whole thing together, and when they're ignited, these iron droplets that are formed uh, basically eat through the silica matrix and form both droplets and they actually creates these large relative voids within the residue of the chip that are all coated with iron films inside. If you take these chips and section them and look at them before you ignite them, there are no iron microspheres, there are no iron particles, there are no iron films contained in these chips. It's only after you bring them up to their ignition point and they go through their thermitic reaction that liquid iron is produced and the energy is released. Um, these chips are not naturally occurring. They are not going to form because some materials fall down in a building and touch each other and get compressed together. That's just not what this material is. And again, I would say that anybody who thinks that should get some, should look at them, should analyze them and come to their own conclusions after actually doing some work versus simply just, you know, guessing that something happened. And that's why I did it. You know, I did it because I had questions and I said the only way I'm ever really going to know is if I get a sample and I do it myself. And that's what I did. And I would confirm that this material is thermitic and it shouldn't be there. This material is not normal thermite. That's the other thing that really needs to be understood. Anybody could make normal thermite. You can get the ingredients, you can mix them together, you can make them. Any kid could basically do it if they knew the, the recipe. This material uh, is composed of the real key ingredient that I don't think anybody else could really make in a convenient way is the nano aluminum. It's a controlled substance. I could go buy it, but the government limits how much I can buy of it. Um, it's very, very difficult to produce in these sizes and to um, 
keep from reacting. It's, it's not something that you just get at the local five and dime or you're going to make on your own. It's a very, very um, difficult to make material. And that's the one thing in there that really tells me uh, specifically that this wasn't some guys working in caves in Afghanistan or it wasn't um, you know, somebody in their basement doing this. This was, you know, a massive engineering operation that made these materials. Where they came from, I don't know. I can only speculate and guess. But it wasn't something that somebody went off and made on their own. Um, it just wasn't. wasn't that. I have called for an investigation. I've stood in, in front of my town at a town meeting and told them about the work that I've done and said that we need a new investigation. You know, to the whole, me anybody that was at the town meeting. My work with this has brought me to feel that this material just is too big of an unanswered question. And it really brings us to demand a new investigation. Something that's impartial, that's based in science, not avoiding looking at the truth or at anything that, you know, an investigation would uh, bring us to. But uh, it, this really demands a new investigation. This is hard evidence that can't be refuted by anybody that goes out and gets themselves a sample of dust and looks for this material. It's very, very simple. Uh, you just need to follow the, the cookbook recipe that's been put together by others at this point, and uh, anyone can replicate the work that's been done and confirm that this material is there. There are patents for building demolition with it. Do a Google search on thermite and building demolition. Normal thermite, the, what everybody thinks of when they talk of thermite, is a mixture of aluminum and iron oxide mixed together in what are called stoichiometric proportions, but that just means there's the right number of atoms to conduct the reaction. Uh, and basically what you do is, when the aluminum sees the iron oxide and begins to react with it, aluminum is very, very reactive, and it basically steals the oxygen from the iron oxide, and it uh, takes that oxygen and it forms aluminum oxide now and it liberates the iron from the iron oxide and produces iron. So those are basically the two species that get produced along with a huge amount of heat. So much heat that the iron is in a molten state, which it melts at about 1500 centigrade, and the iron, or I'm sorry, the aluminum oxide is actually molten also, and its melting point is over 2,000 degrees centigrade. This produces a huge amount of heat in a very rapid period of time. But basic thermite is just a mixture of aluminum powder generally and iron oxide powder. It can be done with other materials too. The real key is the aluminum along with a uh, metallic oxide where the aluminum is more reactive than the other uh, metal that's in the oxide form but that's basic thermite. Practical applications of thermite involve uh, things such as equipment decommissioning in the military. When they have a piece of artillery or a tank or something like that that they don't want to leave behind to the enemy, they throw what are called grenades, thermite grenades down the barrel, let's say. Uh, but thermite does not explode. It simply reacts, produces large amounts of heat and molten materials. And so what it does is it actually will melt a hole through the the steel barrel of the tank or the piece of artillery and render it useless for anybody that would capture that, uh, say in a battle or whatever. Uh, so that's one of the typical uses. Uh, the other one is the military drops it onto buildings to basically burn them down or burn through, even it'll burn through reinforced concrete, you know, given enough material and enough time. So the military uses it for a number of different applications. Uh, another one, if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition, you can find all sorts of wonderful devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolition. So uh, it's used for a number of different things. The only other real application I can think of is it's actually used for metals preparation. It's a way to uh, produce pure uh, iron or pure copper or various different metals in different thermitic reactions. So it isn't just aluminum and iron oxide. There are other mechanisms. But the one that people generally speak of when they talk about thermite is the mixture of aluminum and iron oxide. An example would be that in 1984 there was a patent issued for thermite cutter charges to be used in building demolitions that could shoot molten iron through the structural steel in milliseconds. The FEMA uh, Appendix C uh, information, which is one of the things that really started me questioning things here.